Well, good morning and uh, welcome to the first meeting in 2019 of the Scottish Commission for Public Audit. As always, can I ask all members and witnesses to, just at the outset, to keep questions and answers concise and to the point. And uh, also just uh, as a matter of formality, if members can put any electronic devices into silent mode. To move to the agenda, agenda item one uh, seeks agreement of members to take agenda item three in private. Are members agreed? Good. Uh, now move on to agenda item two. And agenda item two is evidence on Audit Scotland's annual report and accounts for the year ended 31st March 2019. Now members have a copy of the annual report and accounts in their meeting papers. I welcome to the meeting Ian Leach, Chair of the Board of Audit Scotland. And Ian's accompanied by Carlene Gardner, Auditor General for Scotland, Diane McGiffin, Chief Operating Officer, and Stuart Dennis, Corporate Finance Manager, all of Audit Scotland. So I'd like to invite Ian Leach and the Auditor General to make sh short introductory statements, uh, hopefully no more than a couple of minutes each. Thank you, Convener. Good morning to you and to your colleagues. As you know, Chair, our board is charged with the duty to carry out the functions of Audit Scotland set out in statute. And we support the Accounts Commission and the Auditor General in their roles, which is to provide independent assurance to the people of Scotland that public money is spent properly and provides value for money. During 2018-19 audit, Scotland delivered audits of 297 public sector accounts published 19 national and local performance audit reports <clears throat> and produced briefings and supporting online communication on issues of national public interest. The organisation also continues to support both the Parliament and the Accounts Commission in their scrutiny roles. We had 87 parliamentary engagements, that is to say, Auditor General and others, during the year, from giving evidence to eight committees to taking part in inquiries and providing a range of informal briefings to committees, committee clerks and clerking teams, and the Parliament's Information Centre, SPICE. All of this is built on a bedrock of quality audit work, and during 2018-19, we continued our focus on high quality and robust testing and assurance of that work. Given that Audit Scotland aims to assure the public that its money is being spent properly, we as a board and an organisation have to demonstrate that we are managing our finances prudently. As you will see from this year's annual report, we managed to deliver £1.1 million in efficiencies, cost reductions and additional income. This was 4.9% of our total expenditure budget. Audit Scotland's board met eight times during the year and its committees, that is the Audit Committee and the Remuneration and Human Resources Committee, met nine times in all. I am very grateful for the support of fellow board members and for the hard work of Diane McGiven, our Chief Operating Officer, and Caroline Gardner as Accountable Officer and all the skilled and competent staff in Audit Scotland. And believe me, I am saying this, they are highly skilled and highly competent. Thank you, Convener. With your permission, I will hand over to the Auditor General, who is also the Accountable Officer, to make some opening remarks. Thank you, Chair. Um, we've talked in previous years about the rising demands and expectations on public services, combined with tight budgets. Um, added to this are significant new powers over taxation and social security and the UK's withdrawal from the European Union. Audit Scotland's got a unique overview of Scotland's public sector, and over the past year, we've worked to try to provide clarity about the impact and the implications of those changes, as well as highlight the pressures that public bodies are facing. That's meant ensuring we've got the capacity to meet growing demands and to continue delivering high-quality audit work. Over the past five years, our staffing has risen by 8%. That is a significant increase, but to put it in context, the number of annual audits we're responsible for has risen by 43% over the same period. We continue to monitor our capacity and our skill mix to make sure we can deliver the work we're responsible for. We've created new teams dealing specifically with the new powers and EU withdrawal, while undertaking prudent organisational preparations for the various effects that EU withdrawal could have on us as an organisation. The Commission will be aware of the scrutiny that audit itself has received in the past year, we have a unique public audit model in Scotland, and I hope the Commission can take assurance from the safeguards that are built into that model to protect against the problems we've seen elsewhere. 
Of course, we're not complacent, but I believe that the strengths of the public audit model, together with our rigorous audit quality framework, should give the Commission confidence in the robustness and integrity of public audit in Scotland. As always, Chair, we're happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Um, perhaps Jenny Mara can open the questioning. Thank you, Convener. Um, yes, I'd like to touch, uh, to start with, on a point you raised, Auditor General, in, you, in your opening remarks there, and it's about public confidence in audit. So this is something I've asked you about at the uh, audit committee before. Um, obviously, we've had these high-profile cases, such as Carillion, Patisserie Valley, NHS, where um, audit processes were really questioned and the public were left thinking why didn't the auditors get here before these companies collapsed and people um, lost their jobs but obviously this goes to the heart of the process of audit and the reliability of audit and I think there was a report uh, done in uh, the House of Commons quite recently that, that we discussed at the audit committee as well but to bring it to Scotland I really um, want to ask how Audit Scotland has, because you are the sort of embodiment of audit uh, in this country, how have you responded to those wider public concerns about the public trust in audit? And how have you sought to reassure the Scottish public about the quality of your work? Um, I think the first thing to say is that obviously we've watched um, the developments that you've referred to and the inquiries carried out by the Business, Enterprise and Industri Industrial Strategy Committee, the Kingman Review, the the Competition and Markets Authority review very carefully. Um, we want to make sure that we're able to um, fulfil our ambition to be a world-class audit organisation and to meet the expectations that Parliament and the people of Scotland have got off us. Um, the concerns and the failures that you've described have happened in the corporate world. Um, and I think it's, it's not um, a coincidence that there are features of the public audit model here in Scotland which are designed to safeguard our independence and the quality of the work we carry out um, that I think could have had an impact in the corporate world as well. Um, things like the independent appointment of auditors. The um, Scottish public bodies have their auditors appointed by either me or the Accounts Commission rather than appointing their own auditors. We set the fees for that work to make sure they're not too low to give people the resources and the incentives to carry out a thorough audit. Um, we've got very strict limits on the non-audit services that can be carried out, which need to be approved by our independent audit quality and appointments team. Um, and as the committee, Commission knows, over the last couple of years we've been developing a very rigorous audit quality framework that gives the board, me and the Accounts Commission, the assurance we need that audit is being carried out to the standards required by the international standards on auditing and the wider dimensions that are included in our code of audit practice. So I say we're not complacent at all, but we do think there are some factors around the model and around the way we've developed it um, that do give us and you assurance that audit is carried carrying out its role of being independent, rigorous and acting with integrity at all times. Because of course the the real overlap here, I mean you're right to point out that a lot of these things have happened in the corporate world and you're responsible for auditing public bodies but ultimately it's the same audit companies that are doing this work so we see the big four um, and a few others involved in these scandals, mainly based uh, in England and the rest of the UK but um, th they're the same companies that are carrying out the audits of our NHS boards, our colleges, so have they have have the companies that you employ to do the audits um, have they sought to reassure you about their accounting practices? Yes, two thirds of the audit work that's carried out um, by Audit Scotland for me and the Accounts Commission is carried out by Audit Scotland staff, and about a third, as you say, is carried out by firms that we appoint to do it. The audit quality framework applies to all of them and to all audit work, so the annual audits, performance audits, best value audits. That's unique across the United Kingdom. Um, and as part of that, and as part of our general contract management, um, we've had conversations with each of the firms to ask them um, not only how they're complying with our quality requirements, but also what their response is to the Kingman Review um, and the Business Enterprise and Industrial Strategy Committee work to make sure that we have that assurance. Um, we do have more stringent quality assurance for our work than any of the other UK audit agencies because it's a newly developed framework. Um, we think that gives us assurance and as I say it's something the board has been very focused on over the last year um, and we're not complacent about it. 
We've asked them these questions. Are you satisfied with the answers that you're getting? Um, yes, in, in, in general terms, absolutely. That's not to say we haven't identified um, for all of the audit work that's carried out some areas where we think improvements can be made. That's the purpose of the audit quality framework. Um, but we have no concerns about the judgments that are being reached, the audit opinions being reached. It's much more a question of um, encouraging and supporting continuous improvement, I think. Concerns limited to any one specific company that's providing audit work, or is it just kind of quality improvement across the board with all of the companies? I think it's it's across the board. Um, we are, we're now just coming to the end of the second year of the audit quality framework, so we we still don't have comprehensive information that's. Um, significant enough for me to be able to give you absolute assurance, but all of the findings we've had back from ICAS from their independent reviews have given us assurance about the quality of audit opinions and judgments and are focused on aspects of the process like documentation where they think there's room for improvement and that's very much the purpose of the work that we've put in place. Because I would assume that if you had any specific concerns Auditor General about any of the companies then you would probably put the brakes on awarding them further work. And beyond that, I think for both me and the Accounts Commission, if we had uh, concerns about any of the audit work carried out by the auditors we appoint, we would not only not, uh, uh, not award further work, um, we would want to make sure that any audits being signed off had been um, properly reviewed before sign-off um, and that, if necessary, work was removed from the providers. We're not close to that situation. I think that's very clear and I think that will give the, the public the reassurance um, that they need. I'd like to turn to... Um, we so, have a rigorous procurement programme when, before we actually employ them. So auditors will apply to work for us. There's a rigorous procurement programme and the next round has already commenced to make sure we're up and to speed. Quality is a big issue when we select those and they've got to answer and they've got to show and demonstrate to us quality in a continuous basis. Moreover, as you're probably aware, but it's worth restating, we rotate the auditors every five years. So there is no undue familiarity with the bodies they are auditing. And that rotation also includes to our internal staff to make sure that there is no conflict or lack of um, questioning or, or, and, and keeping the matter independent. Okay, thank you, Ian. Um, can I turn to your, your own complaints process? Um, page 25, um, Auditor General, you say that this year you received a low number of, com of complaints, five, um, compared with, I think you had four last year. You say two complaints were investigated and not upheld. But then the final sentence says three complaints were about audit quality and so were dealt with through a separate process, but there's no further information there. Can, can you give us a bit more information on why they were dealt with by a separate process and perhaps what the outcome was? Absolutely. I'll ask Diane to pick that up and I think you'll find more information in our annual audit quality report. Um, <clears throat> while she's um, pulling that together for you, um, the reason we have two complaints processes is because we take very seriously the need to have um, a process by which um, Audit Scotland can review any concerns that are raised about the quality of audits separate from the assurance work we already have in place. <clears throat> That's done with, by, again, the audit quality and appointments team um, and it's separate from complaints about the ways in which we, for example, handle correspondence or, or carry out other parts of our business. So that's the reason for the, the two separate strands of work. Diane, can you give us a bit more information about that? Um, certainly. The three um, complaints which related to audit issues um, were um, complex and technical um, accounting issues in nature, so a question about the adoption of uh, particular standards or the application of particular standards. We have a specialist team, our audit, um, audit appointments quality team, ACWA for short, and they um, investigate complaints themselves or they will um, bring in an external person to investigate complaints for us. All, all the complaints were handled through the process and we've um, referred to them in our quality of public audit in Scotland document. Okay, so can you just give me a summary of the outcomes? Were they upheld or were they...? Um, I think one is still in process because it's a very uh, complex and technical issue and uh, one was uh, not upheld and another one is a subject of um, ongoing dialogue 
um, just to collect more information. Okay, so two are still are still live, and the yeah. third one wasn't upheld. The nature of the complaints is that the um, they are often very detailed matters of judgment. Some of them going back quite a long time, and so we've um, had to look in quite a lot of detail at the issues that are being raised. But I can assure you that we have um, dealt with the complaints um, very <coughs> thoroughly. Okay, I'm satisfied with that answer, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just bring Bill Bowman in? Thank you, convener. Good morning. Just on the independence and quality issue, um, in your financial statements in the Corporate Governance Report, um, which might be page 31, um, you have a statement that says, management team and board members must complete a declaration of interests. No significant company directorships or other interests were held which may have conflicted with their management responsibilities and no, no member of the board had any other related party interests which conflicted with their responsibilities. Now, it might just be the English here. Does that mean that nobody had any interests or nobody had any interests that conflicted? Um, nobody had any interests which conflicted. So who takes that judgment then as to whether they conflict or not? Um, we have, as an organisation, um, a very full process for um, people fulfilling their ethical requirements as members of staff. We apply that to all staff, not just those involved in audit work, um, and it's based on an annual fit and proper declaration that every member of staff is asked to complete. Um, those declarations are then reviewed by the Directors of Audit Services and the D Director of Performance Audit and Best Value. Um, and if they have any queries, they confer with the um, technical team and Fiona Kordiak as, the, as our um, head of practice in the organisation. Um, and that would come up to me if necessary. Um, there have been no instances in which that was the case. So you're quite happy that the appropriate judgment, judgments have been taken? I'm very comfortable with that, and it's worth noting that for um, members of management team and non-exec directors of the board, um, the register of interest is publicly available on our, on our website, so it's open to scrutiny by, by anybody with an interest. Okay, and then note 17 to the accounts, you talk about, which is sort of related to this, related party transactions, um, and you say during the period none of Audit Scotland's directors and board members has undertaken any material transactions with related parties, related parties being any body funded by the Scottish Parliament. What would be a, um, a material transaction? Um, mo most of the things which would normally fall under that definition wouldn't be permitted under our own code of conduct for staff anyway. Um, but an example would be a member of staff carrying out a piece of um, paid work or consultancy work for one of the bodies that um, we audit for a body that's funded by the Scottish Parliament, um, the sorts of related party transactions that we would expect any body that we audit to be declaring in its accounts um, and to be uh, subjecting to the proper uh, independence tests that are required for this. Just finally on that, what about somebody going for a job interview with a, a funded our, body? Our code of conduct for staff um, sets out very explicitly the requirements of the ethical standards there. Um, if somebody is in discussion with an audited body about future employment, they're required to tell their line manager straight away. The line manager is required to tell our ethics partner um, and she will consider whether we need to make any changes to remove them from the audit or to review their work um, while that process is in train. Um, and people are, are very conscious of those obligations and um, do comply with them, absolutely. Yes. So people do it report it? They, they do, we take it very seriously. Okay. If I may add, in respect of my non-exec colleagues, I look at, on an annual basis, any adjustments to declarations of interest. And if there's anything that catches my eye, I'll speak to them and also speak to the accountable officer about it. It's never arisen directly, I have to say. And I am not aware of anyone having conflicts. Indeed, people who are appointed by you generally do not apply for other public body appointments because of the potential for conflict, and we are not salaried. Uh, just moving mm -hmm. on, um, Auditor General, key performance indicators on page eight in respect to delivering a world-class audit year-on-year show improvements except for one thing, 
The number of reports published to schedule has decreased by almost 4% from 97.9 to 94%. And obviously there's always a concern that maybe this is the, uh, an early indication of a bit of pressure on, the, on the, the teams there. So performance is high overall, but are there any particular reasons why this marginal fall in the number of reports that were published to schedule? Um, that refers to the annual audit reports which our auditors produce each year um, alongside their audit opinion. Um, they, you're right, performance did slip very slightly in 2018, 19 to 94%. We still think that's still a high performance, but we prefer it was moving in the other direction. Um, it tends to be either where the audited body has been slow in responding to uh, a draft report. We give them the opportunity to comment for factual accuracy, and that sometimes doesn't happen quickly. Or in a couple of cases where the auditor had provided the annual re audit report to the audited body by the deadline, but it didn't reach Audit Scotland by the deadline. Um, so the Aqua team is working with the auditors involved to make sure that we reverse that trend for this year. Is there, is there a, a specified period in which uh, the audited party must respond? And uh, you say that some of them have been a bit slow coming back. Does that mean they say they exceeded that period? And is there a case for a tougher response than that? For our performance audit work um, for the clearance process, which I think uh, public audit committee members are familiar with, uh, the protocol we have with government is for a three-week period for people to receive a draft report and return their comments to us. For annual audit reports, because the cycle is tighter, it's an annual cycle, and the deadlines for laying uh, and finalising the audit are statutory deadlines, um, that is sometimes squeezed. So, for example, at the moment, our audit teams are looking to finalise their health audits by the end of June, um, the uh, financial year ended at the end of March, that's a very tight period. Um, we therefore don't have a fixed, a fixed sort of um, period of time for comments to be received. It will depend in each body on the reporting cycle and, and the dates of their audit committee in relation to the sign-off deadline. Um, auditors are very clear with directors of finance, chief execs and audit committee members about their expectations and they're not always met. As you can see, it's a small number, but it's not happening. I can see Diane's looking to add to that. If I could add, in real time as a business, um, we are looking at these performance indicators on a quarterly basis, and that's reported to management team and to the board who consider them, and to the audit committee. And our Aqua team report in detail um, on all of these things um, twice a year to the Accounts Commission and also to the Auditor General. So there is a very dynamic process of, of looking at um, both what the performance levels are and what is the cause, what is the underlying cause of any delay. Um, as you see, they're, um, they're marginal and we understand the reasons for the, the shifts. I mean, overall, the, the performance levels are still high. It's just an obvious concern that uh, the Commission might have that there is any sort of trend developing. But, uh, we're monitoring that. We hope not. But, but you will know there's pressure on us and on the audited bodies, so we're monitoring it closely ourselves. Just moving on to something totally different. Uh, on page 29 of the annual report, you state that in 2018-19, you've delivered 1.1 million in savings, 4% of your total 26.7 million expenditure budget. Now, most savings have come from staff costs, additional income, organisational efficiencies, and reduced other operating expenditure. However, people costs reported on page 46 of the annual report increased by a million pounds. So, can you explain how staff savings have contributed to the overall savings? Well, it appears that, in actual fact, the costs have gone up 1.1 million. I think the short answer, Chair, is that our um, the volume of work that we're responsible for has gone up faster than our costs have gone up, so therefore there's an efficiency in the difference of the ratio between the two. I'll ask Diane to tell you a little bit more about that, if I may. Um, people costs have increased as we've increased the capacity um, of the organisation, and also uh, because... So there's a, a numbers um, dynamic at work, and also the um, pay settlement that we agreed with our union meant that the cost uh, also went up. In addition, um, and I'll ask Stuart to give a breakdown of, of some of this, there are pension adjustments and other things that make up the, sa the, the um, costs, and then um, there's also a further breakdown of the efficiencies. Yeah, um, the, the pensions element was actually nearly half a million pounds under the IS19 employee benefit, so that is nearly half of the 
one million increase from the previous year. And, and then as Diane and the Auditor General have said, the new financial powers, additional resources we've required, and the pay award has made up the difference of that. Is the, uh, to what extent are the savings that you've made, uh, to what extent are they recurring savings for future years? Our definition of an efficiency saving is a recurring saving rather than just an underspent. You'll see we underspent our budget um, by a, a very small margin of about, about 68,000 this year, but efficiency savings are where we've managed to find ways of, of carrying out our business for less. So right across the board where you've saved on staffing, saved, you've got additional income, uh, organisational efficiencies and reducing other operating expenditure, all those savings are recurring? For the foreseeable future, yes. Clearly over time that will change, but they're not just underspends for a single year. Thank you. Alison Johnson. Thank you, convener. Good morning. On page 10 of the annual report, Audit Scotland tells us that uh, you've issued 11 Section 22 and Section 102 reports last year, and notably, this is the most we've ever produced in a single year. Um, so I'd just like to understand, given that increased number of those reports, how this has impacted on the use of resources within your organisation. Um, these are the reports which um, I produce as Auditor General and the Controller of Audit produces on local government, um, where, we, where something arises out of the annual audit work that we think um, merits public scrutiny. I report to the Public Audit Committee, uh, the Controller of Audit reports to the Accounts Commission. Um, you're absolutely right, it is the, the largest number we've ever had. I think that says something about the pressures on audited bodies. Um, and we're just in the process now of monitoring and sifting the ones that we'll need to produce for the financial year that's just ended, and that trend looks set to continue. The only mechanism we have got for responding um, to that sort of demand-led work um, is either to reschedule the work that we already have planned. Um, we keep a, an element of contingency um, in the work programme because we know there will be a number each year. We work on the assumption of about eight. Last year we had 11, so we had to find space to do three more. Um, so we, if we exceed that allowance, then we will look at rescheduling other work so we can free up staff to do what's required. In extreme circumstances, we would have to come back to the SCPA and ask for more resources to make sure that we could um, fulfil our responsibilities uh, to Parliament and in relation to local government. Um, it's a trend, again, that we're monitoring closely and we'll keep you apprised of as we head into the next budget setting round. Our concern is that these aren't... There's always an element of variation each year. That's to be expected by the nature of the reports. Um, but we are seeing increasing pressures on audited bodies and we think it's possible this may be a trend that will continue for the foreseeable future. So we're looking at how best we manage it. Again, I think Diane would like to add a little bit to that. Um, <clears throat> on the resourcing side, um, it's been a very busy year for the organisation in terms of what we've delivered. It's also been a busy year for us in developing our capacity. So we have, as you'll see in the annual report, um, done really well to be at 99.7% of the establishment that we have. We've worked very hard to do that. We have run um, 23 recruitment campaigns and made 30 appointments in the course of the year. But that uh, takes time. There's a lagging um, effect there. So we're building our capacity and growing and we're working hard at that at the same time as working on the outputs. And I think um, we're all agreed that um, ensuring we sustain that capacity development is critical for us in the next year. I mean, I think the report and your responses there this morning suggest that you very much believe that this is a trend that is going to continue. Um, but you're fairly confident that you have the capacity to to manage that on an ongoing basis? It's something we'll be working very hard at, yeah. I think we've I think we've got all the right elements in place. We just need to keep working all of them at the same time. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of work to do um, to make sure that we get the right resources in the right teams at the right time and so on and we're working hard at that. So uh, there's that um, work with within local government and with local government and there's also um, you've spoken about the impact of Brexit, uh, increased powers with relation to taxation and social security. Um, I'm a member of that particular committee and the report, your annual report says that Audit Scotland continues to work <coughs> through the implications for our resources of the devolved financial powers, social security, uh, financial powers and EU withdrawal. Um, could you give us a bit more detail around 
you know, what you're doing to ensure that you're adequately resourced to provide audits of Social Security? I think the first thing to say, Ms Johnson, is that we have been talking to the SCPA over the last three years or so about our best estimate of what additional resource we need to do all of that work. Um, our budget for 2018-19 um, had almost half a million of additional resource in. Um, we expect that to arise to about 1.27 million by 2021-22, about 20 extra staff, um, in line with the forecasts that we've given to the Commission as part of our budget rounds. We're keeping a close eye on that to make sure it remains about right. Um, you, you say correctly there's lots of uncertainty in there, so we may need to tweak it in either direction. But we're, we're um, grateful for that support and we're using it well. In my opening remarks, I talked about the dedicated teams we've got for the new financial powers in general and another for Social Security. Um, social Security particularly is a new area for us. We've really done very little work in the past, had to do very little work in the past in that area. Um, so we've um, invested in... Um, training and, and building up the capacity of our own staff, um, recruiting where needed, and crucially working very closely with our colleagues in the National Audit Office at UK level, who've got many years of experience of auditing Social Security currently through the Department for Work and Pensions. We found that extremely helpful, um, and it's been uh, good not just for building our own capacity and expertise, but also because the way uh, Social Security powers are being delivered means we're both looking at, at the DWP, if you like, from either end of the telescope. Um, the National Audit Office is looking at the UK social security system. Um, we're looking at it through the lens of uh, Social Security Scotland and Scottish social security policy. And we've been able to make sure that our audit work there joins up, um, is coherent and can really add value. Now, that, as you know from your committee work, is due to ramp up quite significantly over the next couple of years. Um, about 98% of the total expenditure is still to be delivered. Um, we think we're well placed to do that. Um, the work is um, embedded in our work program, both for the annual audit for the first time of Social Security Scotland this year and another performance audit work um, over the next 18 months. But we, we know, as Diane has said, that we need to keep on um, investing in our staff, making sure they've got the skills and experience required, and making sure that we've got the um, ability to really test and challenge the work they're doing to make sure it stands up to scrutiny from the Public Audit Committee and from the Social Security Committee here in Parliament. Okay. Um, you, you, you also say in your report that you've increased your engagement with the bodies you audit. Um, was that a conscious decision? Was that something that you felt should be improved? Yes, it's something we've always taken seriously, um, but I think the combination of the pressure that we see them being under um, and the extent to which we're all having to do new work meant that we felt there was a real premium on it at the moment. Um, audit's a tricky relationship. People don't like being audited. We understand that. We have to remain independent, but we also have to understand what they're trying to achieve, what they feel is going well and what they're struggling with. Um, so we really have been investing more in that, that sense of understanding what it is that they're doing, um, making sure that we um, really get their business and using that to um, make sure that our audit work has as much value as it can while providing that baseline of assurance that's the starting point for everything we do. Um, you, we heard earlier about the expertise of the body more generally and, and that expertise um, I suppose comes from the how effective the professional training is and we're aware that the key performance indicator for the exam pass rate um, for professional trainees shows that it has fallen. Um, and uh, you've previously advised the Commission that you have worked with graduate trainees to improve the trainee scheme following a fall in the number of trainees. Um, so I just wonder if you could, you know, do you think there's any evidence that the fall in exam success is linked to the increase in workload that we've been discussing? Um, I, I don't think it is, and I'd, I'd um, stress that our exam pass rate is still very high at nearly 85%, but I'll ask Diane to give you a bit more colour around that. Um, our f <coughs> our f I think there's two parts to the question. How's the scheme doing, and then is, is the resourcing, um, are the pressures affecting pass rates? Our pass rates are high. I think the um, average for um, ICAS equivalent would be about 73% for the scheme as a whole. So we're still talking about a very good level of performance, I think. Um, 
there was a small drop in the past two years. There was an introduction of a new exam in the syllabus, and we're looking at whether that's affected just in timing terms and our support terms, if there's anything that we can do. Um, our first time pass rates, as uh, we've said, were 88%, and we permit resets for, for that. So we um, are still running a successful scheme, a retention of graduates. We, um, unlike um, many of the firms, we would plan to retain quite a high level of the graduates that we recruit, and we plan around retaining about 60% perhaps of a cohort. Our retention rates for the most recent cohort is about 66%. Um, so there are lots of positive indicators for the scheme. Um, it's something that we um, look at very closely. We look at the data very closely. We provide lots of tailored and individual support to participants. We want to ensure success. Um, we're not especially concerned about this drop um, because we understand the context for it, but we're looking at as always, at all elements of the scheme. And because we've been with the, the scheme for 10 years, we're able now to take a longer look at how that's working for us and how it's developing. So you're fairly content that you understand the reasons for this and you're monitoring it carefully and you're making sure that you're, you're doing what you can to ensure that trainees have got all the support they need. Yeah. Every trainee has both a line manager and a mentor, um, as well as their um, cohort that they're in. And we have lots of we have regular trainee meetings. We have a group of trainees who are taking the lead in uh, refining the scheme for us and working with us on that. So there's very good dialogue, and um, the feedback we have about the scheme is very good from those who are on it. Thank you, convener. Thank you, Alison. Rona. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Um, yes, I'd like to ask you about diversity and inclusion, which we know is a key priority for, for all public bodies. Um, page 16 of your report refers to you having refreshed equality outcomes and further embedded equality in work to highlight where Scottish public bodies can improve their practice and help reduce inequality. So I wonder if you could expand a wee bit on um, how you've done that. Um, and what outcomes and improvements do you expect from having done that? Certainly. Um, we take our responsibilities under the legislation for equality outcomes very seriously. Um, we have two broad strands there. One is in our audit work, so the way we're looking at equalities in the 200 or so bodies that we audit. And the second is in how we promote um, equality and diversity and human rights among our own workforce. Um, Diane leads on that work for us, and if you're happy, I'll ask her to give you a bit more detail. Um, very, very happy to. Uh, we've published, um, alongside our suite of reports, a report on mainstreaming equalities and equality outcomes, and it d um, demonstrates um, some of the very specific ways in which we have um, taken that mainstreaming diversity and inclusion um, objective to heart and um, embedded it in our audit work and gives examples of um, reports that we've published um, over the past couple of years where that's... Um, um, strongly influenced our audit approach. So examples I would give you would be self-directed support, um, the progress report there, um, early learning and childcare, managing the implementation of the Scotland Act, where we've, um, our report provides findings on how the Scottish Government is engaging with its clients for um, the um, consultation around all of the changes that will come through those acts and how it's engaging with um, groups whose voices are heard less often and less frequently. Um, you'll find um, evidence of our commitment in our Scottish Fire and Rescue Services update um, in Scotland's colleges and children's young people and mental health. The form that that um, mainstreaming takes is very much tailored to the work itself and to the project that we're looking at. We've been working um, closely with Youth Scotland and have developed a youth panel, um, and they have helped us look across both specific pieces of work, but also more generally to see what matters to young people who are in the school and education system about how we look at training, how we look at school education and so on. We have a reference panel um, who help us to um, who help um, act as a critical friend for the work that we do, involving lots of um, representative and uh, third sector groups. And we have, through our programme of work in Best Value Assurance, which we deliver on behalf of the Accounts Commission, we look specifically at uh, diversity and equality there. I can really commend uh, the report to you, and you'll find in there uh, very real examples of how we've taken our 
um, commitment very seriously through our audit work. And how, how is this communicated to the auditors that you work with? And how does that span out amongst you know your your wider work? Internally, uh, within uh, Audit Scotland, we have a diversity and equality group uh, involving um, colleagues across the business. Um, we have guidance in our performance. Um, audit planning guidance and audit planning manuals about what responsibilities uh, um, we have, how those are, um, how we expect those to be performed and the best value audit guidance is very uh, clear on all of that. We also every year will produce and refresh our annual audit planning guidance for all auditors and we have an ongoing dialogue um, with our internal colleagues and all the auditors who work with us um, about our commitment to diversity and inclusion. Uh, we spend time on it as a leadership group, and we are um, we've produced lots of um, information on our website about our engagement and and how we've done this, um, and we also engage with the other audit agencies to see how they are approaching diversity and inclusion in England and Wales and Northern Ireland, and we look to learn from them. and And we have a meeting. I have a meeting with them on Friday this week, and diversity and inclusion will be one of the topics that we're talking about. Okay. Can I just clarify the report you're referring to? Is that the first one that you've done, or and, and how? what's the time scale? Is this a new initiative, or has this been ongoing for a number of years? It's been ongoing for a number of years. We've produced um, several reports over, uh, over the time that we've had um, our duties on equality and diversity. The report I'm referring to in particular, in particular is our progress report for 2017 to 2019, um, which we've produced, and we also have an annual diversity report. We produce a report on the outcomes of our audit work every two years, and we produce a report on our staff diversity every one year. Um, and so on. So there are, there are multiple reports and they're all available on our website. Okay, thank you. Um, just to move on to another subject now, um, can I ask you about your expenditure on legal and other professional fees? I was quite surprised to see that um, it seems to have increased from 474,000 um, in 2017-18 um, to 750,000 in 2018-19. Um, can you explain the reasons for this and whether any further increases are expected for this year? The short answer is that that represents the cost of the National Fraud Initiative, which we carry out every second year. Um, that's a UK-wide initiative that's now coordinated by the Cabinet Office. Um, we facilitate it for Scottish audited bodies, and there's a fee involved for doing that, depending on how many bodies are involved. Um, last year, I think it was about £205,000. Um, so you'll see that bump every two years, um, looking back over the history of all Dip back Scotland. down again for next Absolutely, year. Absolutely, yeah. yes. Okay. That's fine, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, computer. Thank you, Rona. Bill Bowman. Thank you. I've got one specific question and maybe just some general ones. In the financial statements, um, I think it's on page 74, talking about contingent liabilities, you mentioned one to do with a pension issue, which is, I think, going through an appeals process. C can you give some general indication or a ballpark figure of how much might be involved in that? And also, would it be an immediate cash cost to you or would it be an adjustment, shall we say? I don't think we can say very much about the likely cost. Um, the judgment itself is very broad. Um, it's relating to the pension schemes for firefighters and judges, I think, and the protections that were put in place for some um, members of the pension scheme when changes were introduced. Um, it's a matter which affects most public sector pension schemes um, across Scotland and is a matter our auditors are looking at as well. And the likelihood is that it wouldn't be a cash sum, it would be an accounting um, treatment change that we would need to fund um, through the balance sheet over a longer period. Uh, Stuart, you may well want to add to that. Um, and I think uh, you've pretty much covered everything on, on that. That's exactly the, the position we're in at the moment. Um, and it's just... Uh, um, a note that we've put in the accounts um, what we were made aware of it's very specific um, um, and it would so we couldn't really put a figure to it at this stage okay thank you in then maybe just going into the, the accounts again on page 45 your staff report can you tell me how many and I'm not quite sure what term you use engagement leaders or, or the people who sign the reports how many of those are there 
Um, most people who um, sign audits within Audit Scotland are, are our audit directors. Um, I think we currently have 11 of those. Um, and then I sign off um, two audits myself on top of that, the Scottish Government and the <coughs> Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body. Does that make 12 then? I think so. I'm, I'm, I'm hesitating because we have, we're recruiting at the moment to replace a member of staff who's been on secondment for a while. Um, but we can confirm the figure to you separately, but it's, it's of that order. One of the sort of ratios that some people look at is the, let's call them partners, just for the engagement, signers to staff numbers. Do you look at that ratio to see if you think there's too many, too few staff supporting them? It's an interesting question. I, I think we haven't looked at it um, top-down in that way. We do like, look at it bottom-up in terms of making sure that we have the audit teams in place um, of a size required to staff each of the audits and that the um, span of control of the, um, the senior audit managers who are carrying out the um, audit supervision um, and the audit directors is um, appropriate. Um, and as I'm talking, you've just reminded me that some of the, the much smaller audits, like joint valuation boards, um, there is a delegated authority for senior audit managers to sign some of those. So I think it would be better for, for me to write to you after this meeting um, and give you the, the figure in detail. We'll take away the suggestion that it might be a, a quality indicator that we want to be um, monitoring internally within Audit Scotland as well. Absolutely. You also mentioned in one or two places about staff career progression. Mm. How do you see staff from trainee to, let's call them engagement leader, um, you know, what, what sort of time span and, and how likely is it that you can make it to the top? This is an area that we've been um, working on quite a lot over the last three or four years, and I, I know Diane will want to add to this. Um, as you would expect, it does vary, um, but one of the reasons for the changes that we've been making in um, shortening our pay spines and reducing the number of grades that we have is to make sure that staff who are properly equipped to progress quickly can do so. We knew we were running a risk of people who, who were um, building a lot of experience, had real potential, getting stuck at a level where they simply weren't able to be promoted up to become engagement lead. And we're looking to reduce those journey times for people who can demonstrate that they've got the skills and the experience and that the ability that's required. Diane, do you want to say a bit more about that? Um, we have a, um, a very streamlined and simplified um, pay and grading structure that was part of some changes that we introduced some time ago and one of the um, one of the innovative um, elements of that is a process we call career development gateways and so when someone feels that they're ready to uh, make a pitch to take on more responsibility they can make a business case um, to us looking at the work that they would offer the skills that they have to uh, take that forward and the uh, where and where we would find the funding for that and they can um, look to accelerate their career progression if they feel that they are ready to do that and if we as a business feel that we have the work that requires all of that and that's something that we've been running uh, in full form now for about 18 months um, it's going quite well I think about 13 people have gone through career development gateways partly as part as part of our capacity building and progression but we have very clear um, clear marks where the jump to the next career family, as we call them, is evident and um, where you have gateways that you can progress through all of those. Each individual uh, role has uh, no more than five years from the, the entry to the top of the scale and some of the um, scales are shorter than that, um, recognising the time that it takes to become uh, proficient. So we do have some people, uh, one of one member, one, one of my management team colleagues joined um, the Accounts Commission predecessor body as a trainee and is now the ethics partner. Um, so we have some success stories and she's not alone. Um, thank you for that. I'm just talking about the number of um, engagement leaders, 10, 11, 12, however, or a few more. How do you, you talk about rotating auditors every five years, how do you make sure that your people don't get too comfortable and balance their what you might call industry knowledge versus being there for too long? As, the, as Ian said earlier, um, in talking about, um, in responding to Ms Mara's question about independence and quality, we apply all of the ethics standards ourselves, the independent standards are part of that. 
Um, we um, aim to rotate all of the um, engagement leads every five years as part of the appointment round that happens. In exceptional circumstances, we have in the past used the provision to extend that to seven years for an individual just to allow some continuity where there may have been change in um, staff members during an audit appointment. Um, but our aim is to make sure that every five years we are rotating engagement leads as well as rotating the firms who we appoint to individual audits. And do you have enough people to, to do this? Yes, I mean, the only complication arises where we have had somebody leave towards the end of an audit appointment, they've had to be replaced, and we, we then have to um, be balancing continuity with rotation, but we've got enough flexibility with the number of people um, exercising sign-off responsibilities to do it. Diane. If I could add, and the issue of conflicts and the potential for conflicts or perception of conflicts is something we take very seriously throughout the year, not, not simply at the rotation of the audit appointments time. So every year, as has been mentioned earlier, colleagues complete what's called a fit and proper form, documenting any relationships or um, engagements or contact that they have with any body that they're work who they're auditing. And if their um, assignment changes in the course of the year, they will complete another one for the new um, organisation that they're going to work with and we will review and look at all those carefully so we have a culture of disclosing relationships and a practice of um, moving people to, uh, to um, remove any potential or perception of conflict. Good to hear. Then just one on the, uh, the numbers. On page 71, in notes 10 and 11, you've got quite a lot of cash at the bank this year it seems. Um, what, commercial banks, which banks do you use? Stuart. Well, we are part of the, the government. Um, we have RBS, um, where we get money from, through the, the government um, controller route. Um, but our main bank is Bank of Scotland that we use. It's actually your bank account? Yes. In your name? Yes. Okay. Then the next note says, closing cash balance payable to the consolidated fund. So is it your money or is it not your money? We are unable to hold reserves. Um, so the cash that's in our um, accounts at the end of the period um, is is held as a cash balance. Um, and there's then a netting off process for, the, for what we have drawn down from the consolidated fund against what's available for the following year. So should there really be a balance due to the government then? Yeah. If you look at note 12, there's a, a cruel a creditor there for the balance of the cash that's due back to the Scottish Consolidated Fund, so we do put that in there. Yeah. You still think it's actually your cash? Um, no, the, the, I mean, you'll, you'll understand as well as we do, Mr Bowman, the um, distinction between the uh, outturn on the Consolidated Fund and the amount of cash which is held in our bank account at the end of the year. Um, we're disclosing both, but the, the debtor and the creditor related to the consolidated fund are the figures that matter. Cash is a timing um, indicator. Just as a, an innocent reader of the accounts thinking you have a lot of money at the bank. And that was a timing issue this year because of the uncertainty about leaving the EU at the end of March. Um, we drew down in advance the balance of what was due to us in case we needed to um, take emergency action in the event of a no-deal exit. Um, that it's not additional cash, we just drew it down more quickly than we otherwise might have done. Because your bank interest income was pretty low, I think. I think everybody's bank interest income is well, pretty low at the moment, fact, but you're right, yes. Okay, well, I would say slightly confused by, by that, but... You've explained it. Purely a timing issue. One of the benefits of leaving the EU. <laughs> yes. OK. We won't get into that one. Um, do you members have any other questions for the panel? In that case, I've got a couple. Just a couple. Um, on page 16, you say you refreshed your five-year rolling programme of audit work. Would it be possible to see a copy of that? Uh, certainly. Um, we, I think, brought it to the Public Audit Committee um, a, a three or four weeks ago. Very happy to provide it to the SCPA as well, of course. It's I think it would document. be of interest to members. Yes. Um, on page 20, 28, uh, corporation tax. It's only £1,000, but where did it come from? Stuart. To pay corporation tax on any bank interest we earn, so that, that's... Um, an element that we have to pay across. You earned a lot of interest. 
Okay, uh, moving on to page 43, I see there's one person still receiving benefit in kind. There's a fairly substantial increase in that over the year. What drove that? Uh, the benefit in kind is the car which the post holder is entitled to under our car scheme. Um, it's, the, uh, it's the car she's had for a, a period of time. It's the same car scheme and it's actually the same car that was disclosed last year in the accounts. The difference in the value here is the, the way in which HMRC require us to value it for tax purposes and include it in the accounts. That's a fairly big increase. It is indeed. There's no change to the car. It's simply a treatment to HMRC's rules for how it's disclosed. And just curiosity on a couple of things. Um, on page 67, rent and rates have come down. Yeah, Stuart, do you want to...? Yes, the uh, business rates for Westport, the office in Edinburgh, and also for our Glasgow office, um, we had a refund in the year um, from the prior year and also a reduction for 1819. Oh. Good luck. Um, also on the same page, uh, communication costs have gone up a fair bit over the year. What was, what was drove that? I think, and Stuart will keep me right, that's a timing issue as well. I think in the prior year we received um, some fairly significant credits from our mobile telephone um, contract, which had the effect of suppressing the 2017-18 figures and makes the 18-19 figures look higher by comparison. Um, I think it should be much smoother next year looking forward. Is that yes, right? That's correct, yes. And on page 71, uh, note 12, staff benefits untaken holidays... Now, that's increased fairly substantially. Is that an indication of pressures on staff? Um, it's a, there's a number of things um, playing into that, and I'll ask Stuart to come in in a moment. Partly it's because we have more people, as we've discussed earlier. Um, partly it's to do with when Easter fell in um, 2019 compared to 2018. Um, that affects when people are likely to take their holiday around school holidays and parliamentary holidays and so on. Um, but we are also working hard to make sure that staff are taking and are able to take their holiday throughout the year um, as part of our commitment to staff well-being. Stuart, is there anything else to add to that? Um, no, that covers, covers everything. Yeah. This is where staff, uh, any individual staff, for example, are accruing large amounts of, uh, of leave. Our policy is that nobody should be carrying forward more than nine days of leave from one leave year to the next. It's calendar years. But that must be more than nine days. In, on occasion, some people do carry more forward, sometimes on a planned basis because they've agreed with their line manager that they want to take a, a larger holiday um, for a significant birthday or another milestone, and that's agreed. Sometimes it does simply build up, and we expect line managers to take action to bring it down. I think Diane's looking to come in here. Another driver is if a colleague has been on long-term sick leave or maternity leave, they will have accrued holidays that they couldn't take while they were absent from the office. So that will also show up in higher balances. Do you have any staff on long-term sick leave? We have had occasionally uh, colleagues on long-term sick leave. But it's definitely not related to any uh, work pressure resulting in people deferring leave? That's not the main cause of it. But we are, as we said in the annual report, conscious that people are under pressure and line managers are monitoring that closely and making sure people are taking regular holiday. It's good for them. It's also good for audit work to make sure that you're not getting people um, either so overworked that they can't do good work or so close to their audits that they're not able to step back and apply independent judgment. I'd also add, um, just as assurance, that this is another um, indicator that we monitor very regularly in the business and there's active dialogue with managers in the business who are um, kept up to date with the profile of their team in terms of leave taking and so on. Okay, thank you. Uh, if members don't have any other questions, then I'll thank the witnesses for attending today and uh, suspend for a few minutes while we change witnesses.
Okay, uh, I'd like to welcome the witnesses from Alexander Sloan, um, Stephen Cunningham, partner, and Gillian So, the audit manager, both from Alexander Sloan. Um, perhaps we can start just with a couple of questions. Uh, sorry, do you have anything you'd like, the statement you'd like to make? Um, I just have a few open in the marks, if that may. Um, it was just to confirm uh, we've received all the necessary information explanations to allow us to undertake our audit for the end of 31st of March 2019. And I can also confirm there was no limitations in the scope of the audit work. Uh, the firm of Alexander Sloan was appointed to carry out the external audit uh, of the 2019 financial statements and my role was the responsible individual in the audit. During the year, we attended all audit committee meetings. We also attended Audit Scotland's offices to carry out the interim audit work in February, and the final audit work was carried out in May. Our audit was carried out in accordance with international standards in auditing. As part of our work, we have also reviewed all internal audit reports during the year and held discussions with Audit Scotland's internal auditors, BDO. As I mentioned earlier, we've received all of the information and explanations that we were required to carry out our work, and the audit was completed without any problems. The audit file was also subject to second part of the review in accordance with our quality control procedures, and the review was carried out by our senior partner prior to the signing of the audit report. Based on our audit work, we form an opinion on whether the accounts give a true and fair view, whether they've been prepared in accordance with international financial reporting standards as interpreted and adapted by the financial reporting manual and to confirm that they've been properly prepared in accordance with the Public Finance and Accountability Scotland Act 2000 and directions by Scottish ministers. Being satisfied with audit evidence, we issued an unmodified audit report. In other words, we're satisfied the accounts do give a true and fair view in accordance with legislation and accounting rules and the audit report was signed on the 11th of June 2019. And there was no significant matters which needed to be brought to the attention of the Commission or the readers of the accounts. We also prepare a management letter based on our findings, and the purpose of this report is to summarise the key issues arising from our audit and to report any weaknesses in the accounting systems and internal controls that have come to our attention during the audit. I'm pleased to report that in the course of our audit work this year, we didn't find any weaknesses in the accounting and internal controls. Finally, I'd just like to record my firm's thanks to both the staff at, support staff at the SCPA and Audit Scotland for the assistance during the audit this year. Thank you. Thank you for that. I've got a phrase running around my head, and uh, excuse my pronunciation, but uh, quis custodiat ipsos custodis, who guards the guards? That'll be you. Um, are you satisfied in the course of your uh, of your audit that uh, Audit Scotland's managing the, pre the increased pressures it's obviously under with the additional work that it's taking on in terms of the new devolved powers and so on? Are you satisfied they're managing that well? I mean, from an audit perspective, we do attend all of the audit committee meetings. We do uh, get updates in terms of audit quality, and we do make sure we take that into account for how it impacts our audit report. So we were satisfied with any implications for the audit. I'm not sure that answered it, actually. So, certainly, we've not come across anything, any issues or any problems uh, from our observations during the course of the audit. No obvious signs of stress or no. they're coping well? Uh -huh. Okay. Bill Bowman. Thank you. Morning. Um, a question on the work in progress. We have, I think, on page 70, maybe note 19, about 1.6 million of income, um, which relates to work in progress completed but not yet charged out. Now, if that didn't um, turn into income, then the could be an overspend in the, in the following year in, in Audit Scotland. Are you satisfied the calculation of the income to be received for work yet to be completed is accurate and robust? Yes, it's an area we spend a lot of time um, on audit, focusing on work in progress. Uh, so yes, we're happy with the figures and the calculation. Would that amount have been recovered by now? The majority, we. We look at both the calculation of the time spent, we also look at the timing of when the fees 
um, and we go through that for each of the audits to make sure it's been properly calculated. And is there a good history of accurate um, calculation and recording of, of work in progress? Yes, we've not encountered any, any problems in that area. Okay, thank you. Alison Johnson. Thank you, convener, and good morning. Um, Audit Scotland has disclosed a contingent liability in relation to potential future pension liabilities, um, which may arise pending the outcome of the McLeod case. So based on the work you've performed and the information and explanations received, are you satisfied with the accounting treatment applied for that liability? Yes, um, we're satisfied contingent liability is appropriate accounting treatment at this stage. Um, there can't be an accurate calculation of how much we'd be paid over. If there could, then we'd be looking at whether provisions should be put into the accounts. Uh, but at this stage, we believe that's the most appropriate treatment. Okay, so you're reassured that the matter is in hand mm -hmm. appropriately? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, convener. Rona? Thank you, convener. Yes, um, just along the, the, the same line, really, I just wonder if you, you can confirm categorically that you're satisfied with all the disclosures relating to pension costs and liabilities in, the, in this 2018-19 uh, annual report. Uh, yes, again, we look at all of the disclosures and make sure that they've all been done in accordance with the financial reporting manual, and we were satisfied that is the case. And no, no questions arise, arose from from your scrutiny? Um, no, we were happy. We we did a lot of work in terms of the pensions. We looked at the, the actuaries' reports. We considered the assumptions. Um, the actuaries provide two reports. They provided an initial estimate, and then they provided an updated when all the figures were available, and we were happy we had the most up-to-date uh, information, and that was included in the accounts. Thank you. Thank you. Just a question for myself. Um, when you're doing your audit, do you audit the um, fee structure and recovery? We we don't directly audit the fee cover, uh, the covering the the structure of the fees. That would be more of an item for internal audit or um, a free audit. It would be looking at that. We take into account how fees are done and we know there's been a lot of work done in that area and it's an area which internal audits looked at for Audit Scotland. Look at implementation of policy on fees? We'll, we'll look at how it's changing but in, there'll be a limit, it won't be a direct part of that audit itself. I'm referring back a little bit here to uh, previously when Audit Scotland was uh, uh, working on revising its policies and so on in connection mm -hmm. with fees, and I was interested in seeing whether it had been effectively implemented. This was related to cross-subsidies, mm -hmm. which Audit Scotland worked hard to eliminate. Are you satisfied that that has been eliminated? It wouldn't be part of the audit check. I couldn't give a comprehensive answer. I know the fee structures have been reviewed in terms of internal audit. There was very few recommendations coming out of that area. Um, with any audits, there will be some which will have over and underspend due to how actual audit progresses. I'm not clear on the response there. Are you saying that you did look at it, or are you saying that internal audit? I'm saying internal audit uh, look is responsible for that, and would look at the fee suction either. So you, so you did not look at it from that point of view. No, we do. Person? We don't look at it in, in depth uh, in that area. Okay. Do members have any other questions for Alexander Sloan? In that case, well, thank you very much for attendance, and uh, we'll move this meeting into public, into private. <laughs>